Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Tax in 10 with me, Rachel D'Souza and Andrew Robbins, partners at RSM. Now, the press got very excited recently with a story about a dividend payment to Lord Sugar. Um, I don't know anything about Lord Sugar's financial affairs, so I can't comment on that at all. But the story did get me thinking about UK tax residence rules. Oh, for heaven's sake, Andrew, that, that's just so typical. You read a story about a businessman or an entertainer sort of tycoon person, and your first thought is the tax implications. So come on, why, why did paying a dividend make you think about residence? Well, back in the day, <laughs> yes, we, we regularly used to send clients abroad for a year in order to pay them big dividends. This used to work by having somebody move to another country and ideally not set foot in the UK for 12 months. And when it worked, you could pay an enormous dividend to them totally tax free because they were not in the jargon resident or ordinarily resident. And that meant they could come back to the UK 12 months later, bring all of their money with them and not pay a penny in tax. That's right. And there was a similar route for those selling their business. Again, it kind of worked on the basis that the entrepreneur would cease to be UK resident, but would put, would become treaty resident, generally in Belgium, sell the business and then return to the UK, not having paid CGT on the proceeds anywhere. No. Like with so many other things, tax planning in the good old days was much better than it is now. Because none of that stuff works anymore. Um, the government got wise to this sort of planning and introduced the concept of temporary non-residence in order to stop it. And if I'm honest, this is actually, it's a good thing. OK, so what do we actually mean by temporary non-resident? Well, unhelpfully, temporary non-residence rules don't line up with other rules, such as domicile. So for our purposes today, you will be temporarily non-resident, basically if you move back to the UK within five years of leaving. If that happens, you can end up being taxed on your return in relation to things that happened while you weren't actually living here. So let's think about an example and sticking with the dividends uh, there are some quite complicated rules that decide whether you get caught or not but the idea is that if you receive a dividend out of pre-departure profits and you then come back to the uk within five years of leaving you'll be taxed on all the dividends in the year you come back okay so i think we need to tease that out a little bit more if your company has accumulated profits of, say, one million when you go non-resident and then makes further profits of 100,000, you might be able to take a dividend of, of that 100,000 without these rules applying. But if you take more than that, you will have to make sure that you do not resume UK residence too soon. Yeah. And the same rules as apply to dividends also apply to various other sources of income as well as capital gains and and those the and, and although these sort of sources feel a bit random there is a bit of logic to it but you have to watch out for the following so cashing in insurance policies or insurance bonds disposing of investments such as reporting or non-reporting funds writing off loans that you've received from a company and then there's various types of pension receipts which also fall within these rules, although pension receipts are really quite complicated to work out what's actually in and what's not. Um, so in theory, if you are able to be non-resident for that period of five years, you can still pay yourself a dividend to strip out all of your company profits from UK tax. But even that isn't quite as simple as it sounds. And I think that, you know, the first obvious complication is that, of course, you have to actually stay non-resident for that full five year period. Um, and in this case, the five years is, is the date from when you first start to be temporarily non-resident. But 
hang on again, because to make life even more complicated, that date may not coincide with the date you actually cease to be UK resident under the statutory residence test. Oh no, it's just totally mad, isn't it? And on top of that, you need to watch out for deeming provisions that might override the normal rules, which include, for example, being a member of the House of Lords. Now, those exceptions are, are few and far between. Um, but, you know, they are there. And ultimately, I think going back to your previous point, the big thing here is that five years is a long time. If you take a, if you leave the UK and take a dividend the day after you've left, moved to Switzerland. Yeah. And three months later, you discover that you hate Switzerland. You hate the Swiss. You don't want ever to see another bar of Toblerone in your life. And fondue is your, your least favourite food. <laughs> um, you're stuck then staying out of the UK for, for another almost five year period. Unless you come back and pay tax on this enormous dividend you paid yourself, you're now in a position where you're potentially going to make yourself really miserable. So these temporary non-residence rules, and a lot of clients do take advantage of them, but I think it's really important that you, if you're thinking of doing this, get outside of the UK, settle for a period first before you do something to make sure you're going to be able to stick it out. Um, rather than leaving, acting immediately, and finding yourself stuck. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, certainly I have had clients who have found that they are not happy in their chosen jurisdiction and it's, you know, it's been really quite tough for them to make a decision then. Um, but another question that, that often comes up in these circumstances when we're talking to clients is, you know, how will anyone know? <laughs> you know, how will anyone know, you know, if I yeah. come back sort of thing. And and I think the reality here is that HMRC have ways and means of knowing about your financial affairs. And even if they don't, you know, the system will effectively tell HMRC that you've returned to the UK within five years of leaving. So there's a really, really good chance that HMRC will be in contact with you just to ask a question about what's gone on in a period of non-residence, you know, and we see these, what we refer to as these little nudge letters, you know, quite often nowadays. Yeah, all the time. So, so I think, you know, the upshot very much is if you're going to make use of the temporary non-resident rules, be very sure that you can remain outside the UK for that full five-year period. Yeah, um, and understand how those principles work, because otherwise, you, otherwise your advisor might well find themselves telling they have been fired. Well, oh, thank you, Andrew. <laughs> anyway, on that note, um, have you got a recommendation for us this week? I do. I have a new podcast, which is okay. terrific. It's called The Sources Show, and it's all about things like um, the reporting of scientific discoveries. So a, a recent one I listened to, there was a big press report about the World Health Organization saying that artificial sweeteners caused cancer. And what the podcast does is actually look at what was the real study? Was it a, a, a realistic study? What was it really trying to, to achieve? And the answer is, in this particular case, it's really unlikely that artificial sweeteners cause cancer unless you are eating so much of the stuff that cancer would be the least of your problems. Okay. So this is it's a it it's an analysis of claims that people make about science. Um, it digging down, you know, fact checking, really engagingly done. It's called the Sources Show, and it's really interesting. OK, might give that one a go as well. So thank you all for listening. Please do let us have your comments and, or feedback. And 
you can contact, on, contact us on rachel.souza at rsmuk.com or andrew.robbins at rsmuk.com. Until next time then. Bye.